one of the critiques of you is that you're good at creating stuff, good at building stuff, and good at fundraising for stuff, but then somewhere between the conceptualization and the execution is a gap. Oh, that's true. That is probably the best criticism of me that somebody could offer. Like, I'm, I'm a natural starter. I'm a, I'm, I've been fundraising my entire life, and so I know how to pitch an idea. But I have struggled up until the past two or three years to figure out how to start something, grow it, and maintain it. And the organization that we started, Real Justice, is probably the best thing I've ever been a part of. We started that in 2016. It's growing. It's vital. And the main reason it's so successful is I don't run it. <laughs> okay. okay. Like, I have, I have a There's very a limited skill set. And it's just, it's taken me, I, I turned 40 this year, it's taken me almost 40 years to realize that if there are 100 skills a person can have, I have two of them. And when I try to do the other 98, there's some I do okay, some I'm all right with, and there are 70 things that I'm going to bomb on. I have to figure out a way to do the two or three things I do well. And, and those so, two things are fundraising? Well, I mean, there are a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Fundraising and getting people connected to an issue. Right. Let me ask, let me ask you the fundraising part, because one of the challenges, uh, another critique yeah, even, yeah. is the, the, people say there's a lack of transparency with the fundraising. Some pe people, when you're fundraising for families yeah. or fundraising for an organization, they say when the organization doesn't do successful, doesn't work out successfully, or there's something happens, that somewhere along the line, there's some lack of communication, some lack of transparency about where the money goes. And the accusation is that you're keeping it. Yeah, which is a, a, which is a lie. Like, first and foremost, when people say that, that's a crime. Anytime I've raised money for a family or for a cause, mm -hmm. if I kept 50 cents of that money, I have committed a felony. Like, you are not allowed to raise money for anything and pocket it on the low or do it. Anytime I've raised money, I've always had two or three other full-time jobs myself. Mm -hmm. Almost every dollar I've ever raised goes directly to the families themselves. When I've raised money for organizations, I'm not even managing that money. Like, I have never, in the five years of this movement, I've never even had access to a dollar that I've raised. So why, does it, why does this dog you? Like, well, it, no, I think I, I think I know, and I have to push through it. I am literally the most visible fundraiser within, not only just within the movement, but even in this time. Like, I've, I've raised, over the past five years, over $30 million. Mm -hmm. And so what you see me every... You see me every day raising money for for causes, for families, for campaigns. And so what that does is it puts me in a, in a spot of visibility. And it's, I, and I say it like this, I have, I have failed more than most people have tried. Hmm. And, and so what, the thing is, you see me fundraising for something and say it fails. Well, that's not, that's not theft. That may be something that just doesn't succeed. Right. And, and people have to understand, in the age of Donald Trump, if I didn't account to the IRS and to, to state tax agencies for every dollar I raised, I would already be indicted. Right. And so I, I feel I have peace about it, and I feel good about the people that I've helped along the way. Mm. So another criticism that people have uh, made claims on you is that you're not authentic because people think that you are not black and happen to be white. Um, and you dominate spaces that happen to be predominantly black and lead uh, these causes. But people have seen pictures and seen articles of, about you. And was it Bright that, that started that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I think it, it was. Yeah. yeah, it was. when So when this lie came out okay. that I was a white man pretending mm -hmm. to be black, Literally, Steve Bannon was the chairman of Breitbart. Right. The person who advanced that lie, uh, Milo, who was one of the lead writers at Breitbart, mm -hmm. has literally since been expelled from every social network. Right. I was 35 years old by the time this lie came out. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't even see it coming. Right. Like, my story of my family and racial background wasn't a secret. Like, it was, this was something I had shared my entire... Like, I had told this story from stages. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, 
because I am who I am, because I look how I look, there are doors that are open to me that sometimes shouldn't. Like, mm -hmm. there are privileges and platforms that I get that, and, and that's for a lot of reasons. It's one, because I'm a man. Right. There are times that I get an opportunity as a man where there might be a woman who's more qualified, but someone offers it to me. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask myself, well, how do I handle that? Yeah. So what do you do in moments like that? Well, one, you have, to, you have to be willing to put in the work. Like, here's an example. I was on a panel recently, and I learned that on that panel, it was just a panel of three people. I was offered significantly more money than the other two women who were on the panel. We just talked about and that. And I literally had to tell my agency that, hey, I will not be on panels where I am unnecessarily compensated more than the other experts on the panel. Right. And, you know, people can, people can cloud that and say, well, it's because I have this number of followers. But what we see all over society is that men are paid more than women, right. even when all skills are equal, or even when women have more skill. Mm -hmm. And so I try to correct it. It's, it's about being aware of it. I've talked to, I've talked, like, there is this degree of even, like, light skin privilege and accessibility. Yeah. Like, because I look how I look, that makes me more relatable to white people in white spaces. Mm -hmm. So what I have to do, if I have some level of, of relatability that I didn't choose, I was born with it, mm -hmm. I have to use it. I have to squeeze it. I have to maximize it. So that's what you see with, like, mega woke light-skinned people, you know, yeah. <laughs> like... I just said that. Um, <laughs> Y'all go hard, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I said that. Well, well then, then the flip of that is, and I mean, I, I had... Colin Kaepernick and I have talked about this at great length. Because we grew up in the families we grew up in, we also grew up in close, intimate proximity to white people and white problems. And so we saw it and we understand it in a way. And so we're trying our best to, to use it. But I get the criticisms. I try to empower other voices. I try to amplify other voices. But sometimes, sometimes, Good people are amplified for reasons that they didn't deserve. 